Okay, take your Bible then and let's turn to Ephesians chapter 3 once more. Today our scripture is the last two verses of this chapter. It's verses 20 and 21. And our brother Danny has a text for us today. Thanks, come on up Danny. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this small portion of your word. And thank you, Lord, for all that has led up to it. We glorify your name, we praise you, we thank you, Lord God, we worship you. Help us, Lord, to understand, Spirit of God, help us, fill us this morning. Help us, Lord, to live in the light of this wonderful passage of Scripture, we pray in Christ, amen. All right, friends, these two verses constitute what's called a doxology. Uh, the word doxology means, well, it's actually what we just sang right after the offering. Every week we sing the doxology. Um, doxology means a word of glory, a word of glory, um, right? Doxa means glory. Uh, the New Testament letters are sprinkled with about a dozen of these doxologies. And if you boil them all the way down to the bare bones, um, they take the basic form of to him be glory. Right? That's why they're called doxology. Right? To him be glory, and him can be either God or Christ. Um, but they're never just so basic. Right? They're always expanded. So I'll give you the one from Jude, uh, which says this. To him, so there's that part, right? To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you without fault before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Okay? That's the expansion of the to him part. Okay, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. See how it's expanded. Right? You have that small uh, core of it, but then it's expanded in a big way. Okay, and you can see that basic skeleton in these two verses. Uh, verse 20, okay, now to him, and then you have this certain description of him. What about him? And then in verse 21, to him be glory. And then there are three phrases that specify this uh, giving of glory. So you see those three phrases. First, in what sphere the glory is, right? In the church. And then by what means? By Christ Jesus, right? Without Christ Jesus, none of this happens, right? Without Christ Jesus, there is no church. There is no dwelling place for God. So by Christ Jesus. And then thirdly, uh, for how long the glory and the answer to that is to all generations and then literally what it says is okay we it's translated english forever and ever but literally what it says unto the age of the ages right unto the age of the ages that's the far future right the deep future how long is an age Right, an age is, well, I guess many, many generations, right? And the future, in the, in the scripture, the future is conceived of not just as eternity. Um, you know, theologians talk about the eternal state, right? First you have the coming of Christ, you have the millennium, you have the, the eternal state, as if it's kind of a, it's just a single state, a static thing that's just unchanging. Um, but no, the scriptures actually conceive of the future as age upon age, okay? And that, to me, it's pretty fascinating. Uh, you know how the song, The Amazing Grace, uh, says, when we've been there 10,000 years, right? 10 millennia, but it's not going to be 10 millennia of the same thing. Uh, don't you wonder about that sometimes? Um, you know, is eternal life going to be unendingly the same? I mean, we all know it's going to be fantastic, it's going to be wonderful, you know, we all know that, but won't you eventually run out of things to do and people to meet and, you know, you're going to say, I've been there and done that, right, about, about heaven? I mean, is that possible? No. Okay, the answer is, of course, no, certainly not. The scripture says, in him is life. Life grows. 
and it matures, right? Life does not remain in stasis. It doesn't remain the same. It grows. And so the future will be whatever it is, age upon age. Okay, so Ephesians chapter 2 said that God has done this amazingly gracious work of redemption in us so that in the ages to come, right, ages to come, he might show us the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Okay, it literally is inconceivable what the far future holds for those of us who belong to Christ, right? Ages to come, okay? We have our hopes set on the near future, don't we? The return of Jesus, okay, the purging of sin from the world, the resurrection of our bodies, right? The restoration of earth to, uh, from the curse, uh, peace on earth, right? And, and that's for an age, right? And then after a thousand years, after an age, the destruction of the devil once and for all, right? The absolute end of sin in any form and sinners, okay? And then, then what? The end, right? That, the story's over after, right? That's the end, no more. No, there's, there's, there's no they live happily ever after the end. There is age upon age, okay? It shows what we know, right? Who even knows? The only one who knows, of course, is the Lord God. But here it says, to all generations, forever and ever, unto the ages of ages, okay? And of course, the psalm says, a thousand years in, in your sight is like a day gone by, right? So you take a bunch of those thousand-year blocks and you, you know, pile them one on top of another until they become an age of ages, a thousand, thousand, right? What will we be then? Think about the progress we will make in the likeness of God in a thousand, five hundred thousand, thousand years, okay? It, it seems quite the understatement then to me in 1 John, where John says, uh, beloved, what we will be has not yet been made known. I don't think it's possible for us to, to know what we will be. However, if in this life we're making this much transformation, right, we're being transformed by the Spirit of God from one step of glory to another, then think about good heavens. I mean, after God has been able to do his good work in us for an age upon an age, filled us with his fullness, and with that without the hindrance of having a sin nature to constantly be pulling us back, it, it just can't be explained. It can't be conceived in the imagination. Uh, so Wednesday night, uh, the Marishes were here. I was talking to Brother Jim, um, and he said, you know, the, the sum total of human knowledge and our wisdom is like a drop of water, and with God, you know, his wisdom is like the mighty ocean, you know, think about it, thousands of feet deep, thousands of miles wide, and, and, you know, plus all the other oceans on all the unseen worlds that who knows what's even out there. You know, we as human beings think we know so much, we've got it all together, we think we've come so far, you don't even know, okay? We have taken a step into a vast universe of, of God's majesty and goodness and kindness and, and right, to him be glory indeed. So these scriptures, these verses say that God our Father is able to do super abundantly beyond all we can ask or conceive, right? Hyper abundantly. That's actually the prefix in the Greek, the word hyper, right? It's, it's hyper overflowingly above all that we can ask or even conceive God is able, right? He, of course, he is able. Um, in the Old Testament in Isaiah, he says, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this, okay? Are you going to tell him he can't do this? So it's worth looking at, if you will, the, um, the inconceivable thing that he's done for us already and uh, marvel at that much, because I think we do need to get a sense of what is this power, right? And it says this power which is at work in us. What is this power that's at work in us? Okay, when, if you rewind back to where we've been for the last four or five weeks to, to verse 14, and these things that we've been praying for over the last six verses, that we'd be strengthened with might in the inner man, right? That, that Christ might dwell in our hearts, make his abode in our hearts through faith, 
that we might be rooted and well-grounded in agape love, uh, that we might be given this supernatural capacity uh, to comprehend how, how long, wide, deep, and high is the grace of God, that we might experience Christ's love and, and be filled with all the fullness of God. Okay? If we're going to pray for these things, we might be tempted to ask, how is any of this stuff even possible? Well, this doxology has the answer to that doubt. Okay, what do you mean, how is it possible? It says, according to his power, that works, that is operating. And that's obviously how, according to God's power. So what kind of power is God's power? What has that power already done? Already. Okay, it's good to have a clue about what this power that moves within the believer can do. Well, for starters, it's the power that made everything out of nothing, right? That's why is there something rather than nothing? It's because the all-powerful God said, let there be, and there was. Okay, now you try that. Pick any object, a, a paper clip, you know, anything. Will it to be, okay? Just command it to be, okay? Let light exist and it did. Okay, Psalm 102 says, You, O Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. That's some power. That is the power of God. Uh, what did we begin as? Dirt? Dust? Right? I would say that just the fact that you draw breath and you're able to think and talk is quite a long way up from where you used to be, right? Which is to say, you didn't used to be at all. Out of the dust of the ground, God formed man and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being, a living soul. Now think about, did the soil of the earth conceive of what it could become in the hands of, did it have any notion at all of what was in its future? No. Is not a human being already hyper exceedingly beyond all that the inert dirt uh, could have expected to be in the course? Look at you, look at the, the, the thing you are a, a singer, a creator, an inventor, somebody made in the image of God. That is the power of God. Okay? Um, I don't know if you've ever seen any of the footage from um, like the outer space explorers, the Mars explorer, the rovers, or from the moon the surface of the moon, what do you see? It's just, it's absolutely lifeless. I mean, there's rocks, there's soil, there's dirt, and there it sits. And there it's going to sit forever and ever, of course, unless God does something about it, but it's just sterile. It will never do anything. That's what the earth would be too if God had not used his exceeding great power to operate upon it. He said, let the ground bring forth vegetation. Let the waters bring forth swimming things. Let the sky be, what, filled with flying things, right? He formed the heavens, he formed the earth, he formed the sea, and then each thing in turn, he filled them, he filled them. But notice that he didn't say, let the ground bring forth a man. Mm -mm. He said, let us make man in our image. Right? according to our likeness. And he formed the man, and he filled him with life. Now, if you have questions about the power of God that is able to do things within you, I think you ought to think of where you came from. Where did your first ancestor come from, and what was there before that? Nothing but dirt, some dirt on the ground. And then after that, I don't think you should have too many questions about what is God able to do. Uh, and thirdly, the, the, what has this very letter said about God's power? Okay, uh, let's rewind back to chapter 1 and verse 19, if you'll just look. Okay, the power which here he says works in us, back in chapter 1 and verse 19, it says, uh, the working of his mighty power, end of the verse, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Right, and... There's more than that, right? God not merely resuscitated a dead body, which to me, that's quite a feat already, right? 
after somebody has been dead for a few days, not just raised him from the dead, but seated him at his right hand in the heavenlies, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, every other being in all of the universe. That kind of power, right? That kind of power. When Paul says God is able to do hyper overflowingly beyond all we can ask or imagine according to his power that works in us, that is some power, okay? If that power works in you, I don't want to hear anymore, I can't. It's too hard. It's impossible, okay? I, I want to remind you that chapter one's prayer, now where's that? Uh, chapter one's prayer included the desire that you might know the exceeding magnitude, that's verse 19, the exceeding magnitude of his power toward us who believe. Is the Spirit of God alive within you? Then the power of God is at work within you. The problem with saying, I can't, I can't change, this is too hard, this is impossible, the problem is that it refuses to believe in, right, not of course your own power, but in, in the power of God, right? I know you can't. We all know I can't, right? Sure you can. God can. And this is the, the prime item of faith. Where's your faith, Jesus? Oh, ye of little faith, right? Yes. It's God who works in you. And obviously, I can only speak to those of you who are born again, right? It's God who lives in you, God who works in you to do everything according to his good will. So Paul says, I can do anything through Christ because it's Christ gives me strength, right? I can. Right? Surely not I, as Paul said, not I, but Christ liveth in me. But I can work out my salvation. Right? I can overcome the world. I can overcome the flesh and the devil. I can be holy as my heavenly Father is holy. I can do that because Christ is in me. His power works in me. And I can send the devil away in defeat. Um, sometimes I think you hear this doxology uh, misused by uh, followers of the prosperity message, you know, the health and wealth types, right? And think about how you could easily go that way with this verse. God can do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or imagine. So, you know, they say, ask big, right? You know, why not expect uh, that promotion? Why not ask God for a million dollars? You know, why not ask him for a jet plane, that sort of thing, right? God's able, isn't he? Um, I just feel like if you're going to go in that direction with this verse, why stop there? You know, why not ask him for a quadrillion dollars? Like, who needs a million? Like, ask him for a bazillion dollars, right? Why ask him for a plane? You know, ask him to be made king of the Western Hemisphere. Ask him for a planet of your own, you know, a galaxy. Like, that's beyond what I imagined, so why not ask for that? Well, I mean, we're getting into the realm of the absurd, I think. And, you know, why not ask for a body that will never, ever get sick? Well, I'll get a clue for you. You're getting that Amen. in the next life, right? Why not, though, ask for a life with no troubles at all or no challenges, no upsets? I mean, to me, give me a break with this, right? <laughs> we don't want to come to a verse um, without paying attention to the context that it's in. And, of course, the context <clears throat> of this whole passage of Scripture and the context of the letter is what? Unity in the body of Christ. Doesn't that seem almost inconceivable? I mean, look at the church and the shape it's in. Is God able to bring unity to the body of Christ? Um, being built together, being integrated together for a dwelling place of God. Okay, he's able to do that. Christ abiding in the heart. These are the things that Paul has been praying for. He's been telling us to pray for. Um, the Spirit renewing me in the likeness of my Creator being brought to the full stature of the perfect man, right? The image of Jesus Christ. And, you know, to see in this doxology uh, just a request for self-indulgence and easy living, you know, it's just, to me, it's, it's way out of context. I mean, God is gracious, right? He gives us plenty of good things, but, you know, the things that we have now, the food, the house, the jet plane, you know, it's all, it's all transient small blessings compared to what God has in store for us for the ages upon the ages, right? A thousand years from now, what are, what's a jet plane going to be like 
it'll be a laughable joke, right? I mean, what are all of the best um, luxuries of this current life going to seem like to us looking back on them after 10,000 years in the Lord's presence, bright shining as the sun, they will seem utterly unimportant and insignificant, okay? But we'll still be growing in the likeness of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, so what can God do, do in us that is exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or imagine? Okay, what is it that we're to be cooperating with him in and letting him work out his will in? Um, and of course, remember, this is what the Spirit of God is doing in us. He is transforming us stepwise, stagewise, into the likeness of the Son of God himself. Okay, think about Christ. His life glorifies the Father supremely. He, he radiates out the goodness of God. He is love. He is tenderness and compassion. He is our peace. He is joy. He's, the scripture says he is the exact representation of God, right? Wouldn't you like to be in such a likeness? At total peace with God the Father like Christ is, right? Completely secure in his love. Your will at one with God's. Contentment no matter what happens to you. Not the slightest shadow of fear. Not the least bit of desire for the gross and polluted and perverted things of this world. Okay, a life, uh, like John says, a life in the light as he is in the light. Wouldn't you like that, okay? John says this amazing sentence, our fellowship, our fellowship, which he invites you into, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. I write to you, brothers, so that you also may have fellowship with us, so that your joy may be complete. Yes, so that your joy may be complete. What can God do in us by his power that is exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or imagine? Well. I'll give you a couple of things. For one, purification, okay? John says, he who has this hope in him becomes pure, right? Purifies himself, even as he is. Oh, I don't know if that's reachable. Okay, well, we told you it's exceedingly abundantly above all you can imagine, okay? Is God able to do this? Amen, he is. The scripture says he is, okay? Provided you cooperate, provided you set your heart on this, right? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. The things of the earth grow dim. You know what Jesus said himself? The devil's got nothing in me. He's got nothing in me. So imagine being untouchable by the devil, right? Not being able to, uh, not being drawn in by any of the things that cause people, cause us, let's be frank, uh, to stumble. Money, power, social status, sex, that sort of thing, drugs, Christ is untouchable. The devil's got nothing in me. Can you imagine that? Hard to imagine, but that's what God is able to do, right? He is able. You have to believe he is able. It's an it's a item of our faith. He is able. Uh, besides purification, then confidence, as opposed to fear of circumstances, right? As opposed to trepidation. Fear not, I am with thee. Be not dismayed. Is that something you've asked for or imagined? To, to be untouchable by fear, right? Can you imagine yourself as someone with no fear of the pandemic, no fear of the revolution, no fear of poverty, no fear of pain, no fear of loss, okay? Hard to believe, right? Listen to Paul and tell me he hasn't transcended these fears. So this is from Acts 20. Acts 20, Paul says this, and uh, he's uh, bidding farewell to the elders in the city of Ephesus, coincidentally. He says this, and see, now I am going up to Jerusalem, bound in the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulation await me. 
listen to this, it's Acts 20, 24, write it down, memorize it. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, as long as I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Okay, and then there's the brothers trying to persuade him, no, don't go, don't go. He says, what do you mean by all this weeping all over me and breaking my heart? He says, I'm ready not only to be bound, but to die for the sake of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says he wouldn't be persuaded, so we gave up trying to persuade him. Okay? Have you ever asked or imagined yourself as having that kind of confidence, that degree of steadiness? I bet you haven't asked. Okay? I bet you haven't imagined. Right? Think of Paul. This it's interesting you brought this word up in uh, Sunday school today. It's more than resignation. Okay? I know it's going to happen, so, oh, well, I guess I'll just go with the flow. Right? It's more than, um, and it's not an unwilling submission. Right? Well, look at the mess I've gotten myself into. You know, serving Jesus can get you killed, so, you know, unfortunately. Um, do we see Paul and Peter and John, these kind of people, do we see them as sort of impossibly beyond our ability to, to that kind of character, that kind of steadfastness and fortitude, right? God is able. He's able to do much more than we've ever conceived, right? And that's the very point of this text. God in Christ, with God in Christ, that is, it's very possible, right? Um, you ladies, I don't know how often you you know, how easy it is for you to picture yourself as, you know, this mighty warrior. We always talk about the, uh, the uh, full armor of God and all of this stuff. And, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a guy, but I'm not a very big or muscular guy. And, you know, whenever we talk about, um, you know, the full armor of God and standing victorious on the day of battle, you know, to think of myself in that situation, it's a little bit unlikely. Um, but this is the point here. With even the weakest person physically, that makes no difference. God is able in the power of his might to make that person invincible, immovable, unshakable, far beyond what you can even conceive possible. Um, I bet you have not ever thought you could measure up to the, the intestinal fortitude of, of Paul, but he is able, he is able to make you an overcomer. None of these things move me, says Paul. Okay, and I think if Christians really believed that it was possible for God to do this for them and prayed this way, believing that God will do it and quit being afraid of what can the world take away from me, right? That is our fear, right? What am I going to lose? And started thinking instead about what's ahead of us in the ages of ages? What has not yet been made known? What does God have in store for those who love him and the amazing power he can exert in a person to lift them up above this common plane of existence? What glory there would be in the church to Christ Jesus, right? What a witness to a carnal, perverted world. What a cleansing influence it would be in contrast to the hasty and sordid uh, muck, the tumult of this world. Hey, God is able. He is able to make you strong. Uh, thirdly, he's also able to make you a channel of his word to the world. Is that more than you think you can be? You know, I hear people say, I don't, I don't know. I don't know my Bible that well. I don't like reading. I'm not very likely to be much different than I am ever. So I don't see myself really being, uh, really changing in this way or being more useful. Okay, these are just the sorts of things that Paul had in mind. Christ's church, his people, they are the manifestation of his presence. They are the messengers of his words to the human race, right? Is that more than you imagine? Okay, oh, I know he's that way, you know, he's that type of person. He knows this Bible or whatever, um, but I don't think that could be me. You know what? I think it could be you. If Christ the things we prayed. If Christ dwelt in your heart by faith, if you were filled with the fullness of God, you were strengthened with his might in the inner man, and the love of Christ so filled you that you're hungering and you're thirsting for his word, I think you could. Is God able to do that? Of course he is able to do that. It's just the sort of thing he wants to do by his power that works in you. Uh, and finally, can you love? 
Can you love your Christian brothers and sisters as Christ has loved you? Well, that's a pretty high standard. God doesn't expect me to measure up quite that high, does he? Can the church really be what Christ calls it to be? Interwoven, mutually supportive, allied, united. Well, that's definitely the idea of the prayer here, isn't it? Okay. To him be glory in the church. That's what it says. Not just in a few select individuals. To him be glory in the church. Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed for those who will believe in me through the gospel. He prayed that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us and that, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you gave me, I have given them. And there's a purpose statement, so that they may be one as we are one. Is this prayer going to be answered, do you think? I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect into one. Okay, it shows you this is a collective uh, a concern that it's for the church, right? To him be glory in the church so that the world may know that you have sent me, you have loved them as you love me. Is this unlikely? As I said, look at the state of the church right now. It's all over the place. Is it impossible? Is it too much to ask or imagine? Okay, we have conflicts even perhaps in our own congregation. Let's forget about uniting with everyone else. What about our conflicts? What about uh, competing with each other? What about um, um, hard feelings? What about still being concerned for, for uh, what people can do for me rather than what I can do for my brothers? Does it seem impossible that there should ever be unity in the church if even a, a little manifestation of Christ's church has its troubles loving each other as Christ loved uh, you. Okay, well, the doxology says God is able to do hyper overflowingly uh, beyond all you can ask or imagine. So I think he can do this, right? If we believe in an infinite God, we believe that his power is at work in us, okay? And when I say in us, I mean each individual, in, in you, in me, and I mean in the assembly. Okay, within, among us, let's say among us in the congregation. So, so important, friends. To him be glory in the church, glory in the assembly, in the fellowship of the saints. And so that's why, if you just want to look one more verse ahead, just take a sneak peek into chapter 4. That's why the very next thought in Ephesians is, therefore. Okay, to him be glory in the church, generation to generation and the ages of the ages therefore i beseech you i paul beseech you you as a church okay you as a congregation of disciples of christ i beseech you what's this letter about the many becoming one right e pluribus unum remember that okay one family of god he said i beseech you you plural not you individually you I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you've been called, with all lowliness, gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body, right, not many, there is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called in one single hope of your calling. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above us all, through all, and in you all. Okay? Make a start and make good progress. Think about, once again, ages of ages from now, what will we be? Just 10,000 years from now. This is the road that God has called you, laid his hand upon you, and set you on this road to go this way. Let's walk this road together, worthy of the calling that we've been called to. That means put sin behind, glorify God in your body, and in your spirit, right? In your speech, in your conduct, right? Hear these one another. It's going to be a huge word, a huge phrase going forward, one another. Glory to God in the church. 
Saints, you only have to wrestle with sin for a few more years. After that, after we overcome that, right, the next thing is a world where Christ Jesus is king. Okay, and after, like I said, after a thousand years of that, there will literally finally be an end to the devil forever. There will be no more sinners in any form, just God our Father, Christ his Son, and his people, him walking in the midst. And then this is Christ's prayer. Father, I desire that you would be with me where I am, that they would be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you've given me. Okay, age upon age, the glory of God, the exceeding riches of his kindness to us in Jesus Christ. It's all by grace, right? Once you didn't even exist. And then once, when you did exist, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. God's quickened you. He's made you alive. He's given you a sensitivity to his word. He's begun a good work in you. Okay? He's going to bring it progressively to completion, to the praise of his glory. Glory be to God on high. He saved us. He's called us upward. He is able to do far, far more abundantly than ever we could ask or conceive. Generation to generation, ages of the ages, glory be to God forever. Okay, let's pray, saints. Let's give God glory. Thank you, Abba Father, for your wonderful work of salvation in our hearts. And amazingly, Lord, there is so much more to come. As uh, we've always heard, the best is yet to come. We thank you, Lord, for blessings of the present day, and we eagerly anticipate the blessings of the future. Please, Father, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Complete your good work in our hearts. Uh, in the meantime, Lord, we set each other before you. We set our congregation before you. And pray, Holy Spirit, that you would work in each of us. Help us to love each other. Help us to have courage and strength and to become holy, Lord God, as you are holy. All these things we know you can do. We know, Lord, you will do if we, if we uh, cooperate with your Holy Spirit. We know that you will do them. And in Christ, we ask for them. Amen. Amen.